Hello, back again, miraculously, with a Tanglewood AS, uh, a, AS39F <coughs> 339. Is it a 339 style? I suppose. 335, maybe. Um, yeah, this is a good-looking Tanglewood, nice, nice-looking guitar, big proper guitar style. You know you're playing one of these. Um, it's come in without a pick guard, which is kind of how I like them. I think they're just nice as they are. I'm not sure I like the plastic stuff on them, but uh, to each their own. Um, so, what do I notice about this guitar straight away? It's got a chip on this side actually, which is um, that's quite a big bash there. Um, it's been dropped or something. And that probably gets horribly in the way of your fingers when you're playing. So I might just fill that out actually with some nitrocellulose. It's not exactly the world's most perfect repair, but it will it will set fairly quickly, and it means I can um, I can sort of flatten it out <coughs> and I can have a smooth finish, which is probably more important. Um, what we've got here is a plastic nut, I think. Um, I mean, everything's fairly basic, um, but it's not a bad start point. It's got a fair bit of buckle rash, and it's got some sort of strange blemishing on the lacquer. I don't quite know what's happening there. Uh, it's like some of the lacquer's coming off, and there's a little spot there where it's come off. So it's it's um it's not perfect, but it's uh feels quite nice, and the pickup seem to be a bit kind of jammed in place. I don't quite know what's going on there. I've got a, a Bixby style vibrato system or yeah vibrato system which works I mean they're always fairly clunky and what I noticed about this guitar yesterday when I gave it a quick play was that um, the nut slots are terrible and so uh, and there's loads of slack in the strings and as soon as you touch the, the vibrato <coughs> everything went out of tune and I can actually see the the bridge saddles rocking and in fact the whole bridge is rocking here so ideally, in a way, that that's that this old uh, Yamaha here's got an original bridge which you wouldn't wouldn't want to change. But <clears throat> what we've got here is, for a small amount of money, it would be a really good idea if you're going to use a vibrato anyway. To um, I don't know if you we can see this ball, but uh, I would recommend changing that out for a roller bridge if you're going to use this, which you're clear, you're clear you are because it's it's a big deal. It's on there. Um, anyway, that aside, we should still. Be able to make it stay in tune. Um, the amount that the bridge moves isn't humongous, um, but it is, it's, it's a fair amount in a way. I mean, it's not the end of the world, but you can see it moving, um, rocking backwards and forwards on the post. So, really, you'd want that movement translated into some sort of sliding over rollers or movement over a spinning roller. That would be ideal. So for about £15 or something you could replace that quite quickly, easily. I haven't got any spare ones here, otherwise I'd probably go ahead and just do it. Um, but anyway, the, <clears throat> the options for this guitar, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it and uh, set it up. It, the frets are kind of worn out, or not worn out, they're getting worn. Um, there's probably enough to do a fret level um, the first fret action is high, I think we'll put a bone nut on there, we'll clean up the fingerboard, um, level the frets and get it playing so that it stays in, or it plays nice and low for a start but also stays in tune um, over this when you use the, the tremolo or the vibrato unit. So apart from that, <coughs> there's nothing kind of, nothing to stand out, outstanding about it, it plays the electrics work and stuff. So I'm just going to do a quick measurement at either end. So we've got uh, we're almost on 2. 2. Oh my goodness, that's 2.5, what am I talking about? That's 2.5, so it's 2.3 low E, 2.3 high E is less actually, it's just, just about on the 1, which is unusual that it's low, that low, but <clears throat> and I'm not going to measure the the first fret action here, but I can tell you that it's close to one, so it's quite a lot to come down off there. So standard stuff, really. I'm going to keep this all this set up as um, keep, keep all the obviously keep it strong while I do all this, and then we'll just basically change it all out 
the tremolo, uh, the vibrato bit doesn't really change anything of the setup. Um, there, there is a kind of an extra bar you can get to tension the strings. I think rather than tension the strings, I think it cuts down, cuts down the, the or cuts out the chance of synthetic string vibrations or something, which can rob guitars of sustain when there's so much string behind the bridge. It's, those in the know say it's not a good idea, but hey. Um, so the first thing to say is, to make this as good as it can be, I'm going to want to get shot of this plastic, sorry, yes, this plastic nut. Um, so let me just double check, first of all, that I've got a replacement <coughs> uh, Les Paul style. I've got the square edge ones, but I might also have a round one, there's a round one. Just check the spacing. Again, it's, it's bright, bright coloured, and it's, uh, it's about, um, hmm. Alright, let's just look at this actual size. Okay, that's that's a fraction under. So if I was going to replace that, I wouldn't use that one. I think these all might be slightly on the smaller size side. And I may have to use a, a flat edge one, which doesn't really isn't a problem, but I think it's got the, the better width on it. <clears throat> yeah, that's the right width. And then the positioning is fractionally off, so hmm. I'm going to just have a trawl around and see what I've got. Because it's a slightly unusual spread of strings that's slightly off. What have I got? Well, it could be a black one, which actually is the right width and the right string spread. So I think I may go with that as an option. I'll put it to one side for a minute and we'll see if we've got any others that tally with that, but I don't think we do. Um, no, it's interesting. Why oh, that's different size? So these are all forty. Where's my caliper? It's going to be forty, forty-two. Okay, that's coming in as forty-three. This one must be forty-four then. Yeah, that's 44. So this is a 44 width, which means I don't think I've got anything else that will be 44. Nope. Nope. No. Okay, I've got a, um, one of these, but that's not big enough. How weird is that? I didn't realise it was that wide. that one really anyway it's short but it's plasticky anyway so I need to just double check that I've got some more 44s around in future 44 bone nuts and I've got loads of blanks as well which I don't want to cut have to cut one from scratch because the positioning of the uh, slots is a bit harder than it looks okay well I've got this um, hard, very hard plastic one which will work fine. Um, uh, well, okay, let's put it to one side. I'll, I'll use that as a, an option because if this works um, then I'll go with this one since it's the original colour. But if it doesn't work I'll use the black one which is a, it looks like it might be a harder plastic altogether. But this one's nicely fitted as is. So let's just go with that one. Let's get the Get the action set right. We're going to go with nines on this, so I'm going to. I'm still going to use my. I'll use my same set here as if it was a hybrid nines, which is all oversized, which is the way I prefer to do it. So let's come back to square one. Let's get the action down here first of all. Um, actually, no. Sorry. One more thing. Let's just check the relief because I remember thinking this was quite a way off when I looked at it. Yeah. Say so. Yeah, that's about. Say, I've just gone and broken my special light, which is annoying. So, um, so I can't see anything. Yeah, it's about. It's about a millimeter. So it's more than I'd want. Um, let's put the big light on here. Back on. Not this guy. The world of... Oh, please, no. <laughs> I thought I'd broken all my lights for a minute. Um, so I'm going to make 
the world of difference, but it helps to be able to see. Yeah, it's just about one millimeter. So I'm going to want to dial out some of this relief in this neck first of all. So let's get the um, get the truss rod cover off. Are we still recording? Yeah. Am I plugged in? Yes. So I've got a nice little. Um, <laughs> I've just been out trying to release some mice that I rescued and had kept in the shed. And here's me being so noble and capturing these mice. First, first of all, they caught one, rescued one from the cats, put it and bought a cave, bought a tank like a rodent tank from the guy in the pet shop. Came home, got some straw, put the straw in there, did all the right stuff. Got this thing comfortably set, settled down, and this poor little, poor little mouse took him from being um, paralysed and he recovered over the period of a week or two weeks actually and sort of recovered his uh, use of his legs, which was amazing. And he seemed really well, and I was getting all lined up to a point where I could felt comfortable to release him out into the wild with a chance of surviving. Anyway, um, and then he escaped, and I kind of thought that maybe I'd left the cupboards off, uh, the thing off. And um, so anyway, I figured he was still in here, and the cats were telling me he was still in here. And then Morris brought another one in, which I, uh, he wasn't, particularly badly injured so I put him in the tank as well um, with a plan to release them both together since the original damaged one seemed uh, healthier um, back to health and the newest one seemed in good nick anyway so I thought right I'll just uh, give it a day and then I'll take them both out and set them free and uh, so the one of the one I don't know, one of them escaped. The first one escaped. So I figured I had to um, make a, a trap, which I did, which is currently now under under there. Uh, so I made this trap, caught the first one again, put him in the tank with the second one, and was planning today now to go down the field, past the cows, away out of range of the cats, and um, release the pair of them. So that was my plan. So I, I got the camera, I thought I'll do my video because I know a few people on Facebook were interested in these little mice. Carried the, the tank all the way down with the camera running, chatting away. Sat down, down in some wooded glade and carefully un, unpacked the, the cage, only to find nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, and I couldn't believe it. I just, uh, for a minute, I thought the family had been messing me around. Um, anyway, at, what turns out is that They'd bitten away through it <laughs> ages back, and I kept was keeping on putting them in, and they kept on getting out. So now I've got a cage that I can't use. Cage I can't use. Two mice in the shed somewhere. Two cats outside who want to get in and eat them. Oof. Hear that? How bad the nut slots are. Um, two cats out there who want to come in and eat them. And I'm starting again. So the trap is set for tonight. I can only catch one of them in there. Um, hopefully I'll catch one, but then as soon as I do, I'll have to take him for a walk, miles, release him if I can, and we go from there. Okay, so I've taken a lot of the relief out of the neck, and it's quite stiff. So I'm just going to keep an eye on it to see if it changes at all along the way. So, sorry, it took a lot of adjustment, but this, there's now less, but still some in there, quite a lot less. Um, so now having done that, what I want to do is get my, oh, I've got my set of things here. I'm going to use my files and my gauge to cut the nut slot and let's just see if this plastic cuts all right. If it does we'll live with it because it's in keeping with the original colour. If it doesn't I'll replace it with the black one and we'll recut that one instead because I know that black plastic cuts reliably too. Not as good as bone but I don't have a bone one wide enough at the moment to do this. <coughs> but we'll just go with what we've got. So I'm going to take off the bottom two here and I'm just going to set my 
target, typical target action on a guitar like this, I, I tend to go for point 0.3, which is this one. So not too far off there, but what I do know about these is even though, even if this one isn't that far off in height, what I do know is that the, um, that the slot is horrible. So I'm just gonna, first of all, work to widen it a little bit. That's just as a, give me, that give me some up and down room so that the nut file doesn't choke in the slot. So now I can use the nut file and sort of start the more precision cut. And I'm aiming for, to get the string down to just about 0.3. So I'm listening for when the string contacts with the feeler gauge, cutting slightly backwards at an angle. So long as the, the note rings out, then I'm not there yet. So I just come back to the same sort of position, trying to be as consistent in positioning as possible. It's quite hard to do, but um, you can start to feel it going down in height. Um, and if you come back to the same sort of angle, you won't go too far wrong. It will never be exactly the same twice, but... And then as you go down again in the slot, you can feel it starting to <coughs> bind a little bit. So I can just maybe open it out a little bit, but this, I'm conscious that also uh, takes the height down, could take the height down, so just, just go and check it again straight afterwards to make sure I haven't overcut. Um, but what I have then done is give myself a little bit more down room. Um, that's very close, and I can look and I can see the, the air gap underneath this. Um, often I chicken out on the first ones because I don't know. I, 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 the, the, what you don't want to do is overcut it. So often I find myself undercutting it because I don't. I don't want to go through either knocking the nut off and replacing it with another one, or or repairing it, which I really don't want to do. So I t sometimes tend to err on the side of caution. Um, but I have to be bold and go with what I know that we're looking for, which is the point 0.3. No point setting point 0.3 if you're checking out the point 0.7. Right on the mark. So just starting to choke it off. So that's that one done. And I'm going to replace the A. Put the A in and uh, bring the A up to tune. Now, having adjusted the, um, what's I gonna say? Having, I know what I haven't done, is I've done this the wrong way around. I've gone straight into doing this. So hold on, drains a minute. Let me just double check what we've got here now. Having adjusted the action, sort of the, um, the relief, what I should have done next, it, it's not the end of the world, but. I would have preferred to have adjusted the action, which is why I got the screwdriver out. So let me just take this down a little bit before I do any further work on the nut. We're actually going to run out of downward movement any second now, which is sometimes a problem I found with these semi-acoustics. You can get down to the you get down to 1.5 millimeters, then we can't go any further. That's your lot. Now the only way you can go any further is to um, is to cut away the underside of the bridge, which is not, not a problem really, but 1.5 should be okay. And then on this side, we're, we're barely at one, which is as low as I'd want to go anyway. So that's okay. So let's go back to these, we'll check these. They've still got good clearance over there. Drop this one off and I go back to where I was with the A. So that was just a little bit of a, going the wrong way around things. Um, yeah, it's interesting, uh, semi-acoustics, not the first one that I've found where you run out of downward adjustment. Um, maybe the idea is somebody's not really thought you're ever going to play it that low, I don't know, but uh, there's no reason why they shouldn't play low. Um, well, there's no, in fact, there's no reason why you wouldn't want them to play quite low. Uh, but uh, yeah, they, I've had them run out adjustment, run out of adjustment room before. Not a lot of room there, so a little tiny bit more, a whiff more. So having taken some uh, relief out, that's also changed the action. Um, some 
people, some people use the truss rod, or consider the truss rod, as the, or treat it as if it's the primary way of adjusting the guitar's playing action, which it isn't meant to be. Um, the raising or lowering of the action um, as a result of adjusting the truss rod is, is what you might consider as a secondary effect of using the truss rod adjuster. Um, your, your adjustment for action is much more important by doing it at both ends, the nut slots and the bridge. Um, any, when, you, when you adjust the truss rod and change the curvature, you're basically changing the action more towards the middle than anywhere else. Although, of course, it changes a little bit at either end too. It's more in the middle of the curve, curved part of the neck, um, and it's it's definitely so. It's true to say that if you crank a huge curve into the neck, you you will raise the you will make the action in the centre of the neck feel a lot higher. Um, if you want a low action, you wouldn't go to the truss rod first and foremost as your primary way. You would go to set it here. Um, the, the, consideration about adjusting the truss rod is so that you have a little bit of curvature to allow the strings to move that's it's kind of as far as I have ever understood that's its primary function it counteracts the pull of the, the truss rod it counteracts the pull of the, the strings which tend to pull the neck into a, a curve um, the truss rod resists that uh, and, and is adjustable so it resists it in a controllable way so that you can dial the amount of curvature you want well, this is now hitting the pickup, so that's why it's making a noise. Um, yeah, so it's uh, the truss rod's primary purpose. Oh, this is stuck. I think I need to investigate why these aren't adjusting. This is not good. Um, I just have to live with it for a minute, but there's something not quite right under here, but we've got it down a bit. Um, Yeah, so truss rod's purpose is to control the amount of bend in the neck, and the bend is caused primarily by the pull of the strings, the loading of the strings. Um, on some truss rods, it's a positive thing either way. You can you can bend the opposite way using the truss rod, even if the strings uh, haven't got the loading to, required to pull the neck. So it's a, it's a direct a direct um, curvature in the opposite direction. But, but anyway, the point is, you, you think of the truss rod as something to set an ideal, first and foremost, to set an ideal um, cur neck curvature. And that's, you know, don't think about action, think about what is the, what is the ideal curvature and why. And uh, if you've got a very accurate neck with very, 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 very level frets, you can have almost a straight neck without any curvature in it. Um, but the, low, the point being is the lower you go, the more likely you're going to need to add some curvature to stop the strings slapping against the fingerboard where they rotate in their middle middle point. Um, so that's what you would have curvature in the neck for. Um, the fact that it raises or lowers the action from the middle point outwards in either direction is sorry, highest in the middle progressively less towards the end. The fact that it raises the action a little bit, the playing action, is secondary and it's not what you would use the rod for. <sighs> Hence, uh, what I would normally do, what I forgot to do here, is I'd normally put the amount of curvature I wanted into the truss rod first and then set about um, getting my action at both ends and then going to the uh, setting of the first fret action, sorry, the action at both ends and then the fret levelling after that. Okay, so so in a way I've got a bit more clearance here, it's not a lot, so I'm going to stop there. Um, but one of the things I'm glad about cutting some uh, some uh, having to cut down into these, you hear that pinging, that is a mess of a nut slot. It's awful. Um, so the good thing about doing any adjustment to these uh, slots here is that it's going to cure 
I'm going to make it cure that creaking, sticking nonsense um, so that the strings run smoothly and that will be half of the tuning issues resolved there and then in one swoop. So again I'm going to start by widening out this slot a little bit, cleaning out the guns that were already in it and then I'm going to work with the correct file. And you may have noticed from my videos, or if not, I'll tell you that I work over size every time. So if I have a, if I'm going to put on a set of hybrid nines, I take a oversized set of um, files. So for example, for a nine, I'm using an 11. For uh, a 17, I'm using a 24. I want more space rather than less. And I know over time, I've learned you can get away with quite a lot more. Um, than the gauge you're using um, without having any kind of buzzing problems or sitaring noises or anything. Now the reason you'd go larger is because first of all if you go exact you will get pinching and there's no doubt about it you will have to spend time sanding out the width of the slot and so on it's just pointless you might as well start bigger than you mean to go on. Um, and the second thing is of course is you if you do if you only do exact to the gauge you're fitting um, you will be stuck when you, if and when you want to increase the gauge, um, you'll have to redo them all with a different set of files and so on. So logic for me was, when I looked at other guitars and saw that most factory guitars come with slots cut for, to accommodate anything up to your 13s or stuff, you know, gauges, large size gauges, was it, they must do. The factory doesn't want you to, it doesn't think you should have to file them down every time you change a gauge. So it makes its factory nuts accommodate all sizes and they play fine, they wouldn't. I mean, the, the, the nut heights are always wrong, but the fact is the width isn't a problem. So I take a cue from that and go comfortably above what I'm fitting. Um, it may still require work if you were going up two complete gauges, but for one, a, a build, building in here, plenty of room for this gauge and a possibility of using another gauge up from this without any constriction problems. Um, now why do I make that call? Why do I take that risk of or you know go so far out of the gauge kind of recommended gauge? Because of all the things this guitar can't afford to do um, in terms of what what What's the thing that spoils enjoyment of playing this guitar, first and foremost? Uh, strings sticking in the nut slots and going out of tune because of it. It's kind of like, for me, the number one downer. The number one thing I don't want it to do. Because uh, if they do that, then the thing isn't worth playing and it's unbearable and you won't want to play it. So to me, it's all about getting this bit critical to get this bit right and, and have the slots running free so that this stays in tune, particularly when you're using uh, vibrato. But anyway, um, you'd be amazed how huge an impact the nut slots have on tuning. Something I found out after doing it many, many, many times, and now I pay, that's why I pay so much attention to this. All right, the action is already nice and low, I can feel it. What, what I do with this method is I choose the action that we want to play, and then I, I make the, I basically set the action the way we want to play it, which is what I'm currently doing now, finishing setting the action at this end. Um, and then what we'll find as soon as we've set this nice low action is well, no doubt we'll find that the frets, the unevenness of the frets, will suddenly start showing up and get in the way of the notes at that end. We may find that we have choking, uh, buzzing frets and choking notes up here. And of course, it's probably, or more than likely, the, re the reason um, any guitar that you buy second hand will come to you with a, 
as, uh, as high an action as it does, and it's probably because it's it's been set as low as it will go before the whatever underlying uneven frets the guitar has have then sort of made themselves known and spoiled spoiled the playing. And so typically the owner then backs off the action a little bit um, until it's playable again. So in this case, instead of being dictated by the condition of the frets, we're going to, or I am currently setting the action the way we want it. And then we're going to go um, and make the frets comply with that. So I expect right now, and if you were doing this, don't be at all surprised, and in fact expect that the minute I stop doing this and go and try out the notes up there, expect it to choke and buzz. Um, it's precisely what we'd expect. Um, and then the, the rest of the process, the fret levelling process, is the, is the process of making the underlying frets work with this action. Now, this is taking a long time to reach the required height and it's tempting to push too hard or go a bit crazy and it's right at this point that this is likely to overcut and we are so close it's only a little bit of fresh air um, and I don't want to overcut and find myself having to repair, replace or repair so I may even just stop at this point for a minute and move to the next one to get as near as I can because we are talking a very small a very small uh, clearance this one's low that one's where it is to begin with so that's all good okay so now we've got very low action um, what I also noticed about this one is there's a huge step up in the height of these saddles that it makes a very uneven uh, radius radius yeah it makes a very uneven thing it kind of goes flat flat big jump up same height jump down jump down or jump down flat so a bit odd at this end for my liking Now this is immediately playing in tune, whereas it wouldn't before when I was using the tremolo, it was going out of tune. So what you find is on a guitar like this, the tuning problems all live at this end, not the tremolo or the bridge end. Um, it, you, I still recommend a roller bridge here just because it's, it actually would stagger, it would kind of stagger the, the radius a little bit better for my liking but anyway um, it's not really the critical the key culprit in the tuning it's that there but having um, now done you know clean uh, sand it filed those down to the correct uh, size and also cleaned them out in the process and widened them in the process we've now got stable tuning already even with these old strings on which have probably still got some slack in them that needs to be stretched out but that that's uh, neither here nor there because we're going to chuck them away in a minute. So that sort of thing's moving in the right direction. I'm just going to double check uh, what's happening with the truss rod because things do change over time. Okay, I'm happy with that for now. I'm going to put this back on more so that I don't lose any of these little bits than anything else. And also in the, in the hope that we don't need to make any more adjustments. It's almost impossible to handle things like in this position but anyway um, so the next stage is to having set the action now and having um, got the nut slots uh, this end right so the action at both ends is set and the, the relief in the neck is set the way I'd like it which is just a little bit probably about a fifth of what it was actually um, in terms of actual measurements now as I said a minute ago with this new low action 
what I would probably expect, judging by how it played before, is to run into some major choking up here. And that's aside from the chance of this hitting the pickups, which currently it isn't, but it was before. So, um, plays, but lots of lots of sizzling, as I would call it, and it's not sounding great. So, now's the time to get on and put that right. So, the first thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to slack off the strings and prepare this creature for um, for fret leveling. Now, notice I'm not doing any cleaning or anything right yet. I'm just working with the strings on as they are. Um, once I've done the fret leveling, then I can clean anything I want to afterwards and check anything. And in, for example, also take some of the excess plastic off the top of here, just so it doesn't have as much over the top of the strings as, as that. It doesn't need that much. So now, with the strings pulled off to one side, I can I can start to mark up the uh, frets. And I can see what condition they're in. They're not too bad, but they are a bit flattened. So well, that's one of the things that's good about using my um, banana method of fret leveling is that it takes off only as much um, metal as required to reach a good clean playing action that we set as opposed to uh, other methods which tend to sort of aim for an arbitrary notional levelness you know maybe 100% level as judged by you know the flattened neck and a fret rocker in this case I'm just going to level until the note plays cleanly and then I'm going to back off and uh, in, in doing so therefore preserve as much fret metal as is necessary or as is possible. Um, you know particularly on a guitar like this um, where the frets are not new. I'm just looking here, there's some indentation on the fingerboard from acid. Oh, hang on, hang on. Acid finger nails, acid sweat. <laughs> Come in, but don't let... Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see my post? No, I've just seen no. all the empty things. No, there. they weren't in there. Look on the top edge, back edge of the cage, the, the bars. I went all the way over the field and empty that straw <laughs> which means they're both in here yeah so hey. i have to catch them again one by one but i can't yeah. put them in that stupid tank <laughs> i filmed everything i'm going oh <laughs> anyway thanks for my tea i'll see you in a bit i'm keeping the cats out obviously now damn the cats <laughs> anyway where was i oh yeah tuning up Um, yeah, so f this method saves on fret life. Listening all the time to hear for pings. So that could be in part because it's got rust on the strings here. So I'm not going to worry about that too much, but I will be standing by with some sandpaper to um, just widen that out if necessary. Okay, so there's my guitar set of the action I want. Um, both ends, truss rod set with the small amount of relief that I want um, and having played it I know that there's a lot of sizzling of notes so the frets aren't great at this end so now I'm going to with that all set that way I'm now going to use my fret leveling device to level these frets out and in doing so take while whilst taking as little metal 
as possible off the frets um, at the same time as achieving uh, a nice clean set of notes. That's the ambition. Sometimes you have to do it twice, sometimes you can't quite get it the first time and you, I stop um, and play it and then I think now I'm going to do this a little bit more. So that happens to be set right, right from the outset. Um, I'll just double check it and I always say calibrate this as many times as you can but that actually happens to be the same curve by chance. Um, so then I lift out this rusty string um, spread the string off to one side, give myself room to work and with the weight of this uh, tr truss rod or banana as I call it for obvious reasons because it's now curved and now rocking it or moving it, sliding it backwards and forwards over the frets um, with a view to just taking off the tops of any frets that are higher than any others. Now the first thing I can see straight away without doing too, you saw it's only a few seconds there, so I stop and I go, right, we're cutting here and here, tiny bit there, nothing, 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 some there, quite a bit there, quite a bit there, a little bit there, a little bit there and there. So we're, we're doing right at the end, nothing in the middle. So the first thing that tells me is I'm going to slack this right off, if I can do it. I'm going to let it kind of reset itself. I'm going to replace the string and I'm going to recalibrate. Now it could be that I, I got the calibration right and in fact there are lower frets, or the frets in the middle that are just happen to be a little bit lower. It's entirely possible, but there's no harm in doubting or questioning my, my initial calibration, and I'll go at it again. So I place this down, and this time I'm going to kind of tighten up to, um, to the point where I reach calibration. So little turns, it's microscopic turns, and once you do this you get a feel for it. Um, you're basically aiming to get all three touching in exactly the same amount and you'll see when you get there. So right now I haven't got there yet and when I do then I'll just carry on. Now that's probably, if anything, that's a tiny bit over because it's touching the middle before the far end. So I'll just back off a fraction and now it's too little so I'm skating over the top of the middle one which means I've lost the curvature. So it's almost a, sort of a, a hair's breadth, right? That's dead on. Now I'm going to, confident that I've recalibrated and that's correct, I'm going to go back at it and trust my calibration this time. Handling it carefully so I don't accidentally undo the settings or anything. And then just let it, let it work. And it is saying, okay, those are low frets compared to some of them. And that's okay with me. I'll just keep working for a little bit, trusting my calibration, go right to the edge. So I'm working on what I would call the E track and uh, freeing up the notes in that track where the E note sits. Now this is a very low action we've chosen anyway, one millimeter on the high E is incredibly low and for a semi-acoustic as well. So I'm going to stop there which is the beauty of this system and before I take any more metal off play it through and there are still some notes there that are what I would call zinging or sizzling um, and I'm going to go back and just work it a little bit more. Now with a semi-acoustic guitar uh, if I didn't get a millimeter on the top high E honestly I wouldn't be that disappointed I would slack, uh, slack off. I would go back uh, up a little bit retreat up from the one millimeter to 1.1 or 1.2. My normal target for most guitars is 1.2. Um, if you've got enough fret metal, you can kind of chase it down to the one millimeter. Um, it means you you end up having to you work a lot of the frets harder to get into the lower spots. If you like, you kind of you, you basically you're having to bottom out the lowest of the spots rather than the highest, or it's governed by the low spots. So the low spots here are making these a little bit higher and that's why these are, are cutting up more than there. Well that's why these are cutting up at all because these are actually lower. Um, so 
if we wanted to make those play absolutely perfectly, we'd still need to take a little bit more off these top few, which I'll, I'll carry on doing um, for the simple reason that it's quite common for there to be a bit of a glut of frets at this end because the neck tends to bend less, especially on the glued neck, tends to bend less right at that point. Um, and it can make a little shelf, which there's really no option but to just scoop it out a bit with a fret leveling tool like, like this one. With a flat leveling tool, you can't do that scooping out. So what people, luthiers, tend to do is the thing called fall away, where instead of what I'm doing, which is trying uh, sort of gently imposing the curve on this slightly flattened off spot, they would tend to just flat uh, level everything backwards from about the 13th fret, just to be absolutely sure that everything will play. Um, We're very close to being there, and I'm going to stop at that uh, setting. I'm not going to go any further with that. I'm going to see how that works, and if necessary, I'll raise the bridge by a tiny fraction to get above that. I don't want to take any more metal. Now, I'm using the same calibration for the next strip, and I'll recalibrate for the next one after that. Um, so this one is interesting because now, straight away, it's cutting in different places almost immediately, um, which is quite an interesting sort of diagnostic in a way. So previously it cut there first, and here now it's cutting here first. So there's a, a couple of frets here and here that are showing up as high, whereas it was these before. So it could well be that somebody else has leveled or, or over leveled the edges of some of these frets, which has made, made that section seem low. That's pretty good actually. I'm going to do a tiny bit more and concentrate on the top of the, the sequence, but um, nearly there. So just see where, where I'm working. Again, we're just sort of concentrating on the B track or where the B string falls going up the neck, but working either side of it a little bit to blend it in with uh, the other track. And once you once you sort of get there. You'll, you'll you kind of know because the notes will be pretty much as clean as you can get them. That will do me. Again, we're very low, so it's a it's not a bad outcome. And I tend to aim low, and then if I need to, I will raise the bridge, but only by a fraction of a turn. There's the tiniest adjustment. Um, that you won't even notice in terms of playing action, the tiniest adjustment will lift you clear of those last little frizzles. Okay, so you can see I've had to add in a little bit more curvature now as we came across to the G track, um, and it's quite common that happens. The thing changes, the relief of the neck changes as you move across it. Um, Often for me, I find it's different between the high E track and the low E track. But in a way, you can see this is interesting because it's cutting some high spots right in the middle now. It, kind of the opposite places to where it was cutting at the start, which were a different set of frets and to the outside. And this is cutting pretty, pretty intensively there. So that's a significantly high one right there in the middle of the guitar, or in the middle of the neck, I should say, and in the middle playing uh, fretboard. Tiny bit up the top there, I'll just work on that. I want to say work on that, it's sort of, although I'm using the same curvature all the way along, there's something about when you say you're focusing on the end, it's like you kind of, I don't know, maybe you add a little more pressure. I can't really say how I know, it's a bit intuitive or a bit a bit touchy-feely, but I'm sort of concentrating on this end a little bit heavier. Now it's still obviously lowering frets elsewhere, but I'm kind of I'm really looking to lower the troublesome ones right, right up there. Sometimes what I'll find is there's a whole crop of frets that just seem really, really low for some reason. This is a horrible saddle. It's sticking way out of line with all the rest. It needs to be down there. Take a. It's not back in properly. That's why. 
Okay, it wasn't wrong in the first place. Um, let's just... Right, I'm happy with that. Let's just take, see if I can take care of that one before we get on to doing anything with the fret leveling because this is, there we go. No, it's tilting forward. Why is it doing that? It's not happy, is it? Trying to get it to sit. Something about it, it's tilting forward and it's under, under load. It's tilting forward, so I would suggest a replacement bridge at some point, not too far from here. Is it sticking up that much now? Possibly, or possibly not, let's have a feel. Yeah, it is still, still wants to do it. There's something about the way it's anchored, this is not good. It's always going to do it, I can see it. Right, well, I'd recommend. Recommend a, a change of bridge. But it's better than it was anyway. I pushed it down and it stayed nearly down. Okay, so now, having done that, we'll move on to the D track. Um, so, just looking at this, it's quite a lot of... Um, a lot of leveling going on here for an old guitar. An old guitar. That's a bit over. So I'm going to slack it back off. Um, yeah, sometimes you get whole clusters of frets that seem incredibly low, i.e., they cause the next set to be incredibly high. And this, you can tell that something untoward has happened. It's not not just standard. Um, and sometimes I found on guitars that it gives up the story. It sort of reveals itself as you go through it and it just becomes apparent what's happened um, and, and sometimes for example I'll discover that a guitar has at some point fallen forward on its face and bashed a piece of furniture or table edge which has driven the frets uh, driven the strings into the frets causing chips and you can see a pattern sometimes and then what somebody's done um, because it's then a bit unplayable you, you can see that the owner has then taken some sandpaper and applied it to the spots to cure the problem as much as they can and in a sense that's okay it works uh, to a degree um, and at the action they've chosen but um, as soon as you go any lower that's good as soon as you go any lower then suddenly you find it doesn't work anymore um, and, and because spot leveling uh, tends to create problems as, as it solves a local problem it creates unevenness elsewhere or relative unevenness elsewhere so it can be an absolute pain um, but often th those things won't kind of reveal themselves until I get some, some of the way into it and I'm, I can't work out why I can't seem to get the or I, I'm going loads taking off loads of material at either end but there's something in the middle that just will not near the middle that just will not um, bottom out and it's it's beyond normal wear you can see that it's not because it's just worn that way it's 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 being cut and you can you know you can often track down somebody else's heavy-handed work um, it reveal itself as you try and achieve an overall nice fret level and um, yeah, that's the fun of the game it's a bit like playing Columbus or something so against telling me there's a couple of frets here that are really high and one there um, one there but the rest of them okay or lowish so having done this tiny little bit there having done this once I've finished this then the next thing to do is to just reprofile the frets um, in order to just round off or reshape any flattened frets which because this process is putting a flat spot on them. So the next thing we do is to re-profile uh, the frets to put them back into as close to an arch form as possible um, which we do with a, a special file 
um, but we have to do it in such a way that it doesn't change the relative heights of the fret tops because we don't want to reintroduce un any unevenness to it, of course. And um, so once we've done that and retained the relative level, which we've worked hard to achieve right now, then we just polish out all the frets to get them into a, a nice ready to play condition. Um, and then in a way the hard work of the fret leveling is done. Um, and what you're left with is a, a good clean up, um, checking everything else, um, and then you can chuck the strings away, reshape the nut if you need to, clean up, do any electrical repairs if you had any problems. And then once you restring it, what you'll find is that the neck will then return to its loaded state, which it is currently. Um, and in its loaded state, the frets will resume their relative levelness since you've leveled them in the loaded state. And that's what's quite good about this. Now, if these are tens, it will change slightly when I put a set of hybrid nines on, which are a bit lighter. Um, so what we might find is it doesn't pull quite as much relief, but we might need to just make a tiny adjustment for that. Almost there. Two tiny little points we can improve on. It's very minor. Um, so again, I'm just going to focus on this end to get it to play how I want it. And the thumb is just down there, is just guiding it a little bit, really. And then I'm just going across side to side to connect it up with the other tracks. And you can see there's some frets here that just aren't touched at all, and they are literally low in relation to the other ones so and it's the low frets that create high frets by you know their relative lowness to the one in front of it so these frets here you can probably just see it. it's a good example these two low frets here are making that one high and it's saying to me if so for some reason these are incredibly low, they may have already been filed down by somebody. But if I want to stop that noise, I'm going to have to keep on taking these down until I reach a place where we're kind of bottoming out um, with the low spot. Now, like I said, if it was just normal wear, you can be you can be fairly confident that you won't find yourself scraping along the fingerboard at this rate. However, if the reason those two frets are low is because somebody's done some damage and already leveled them out uh, or scraped them out with a with a, a you know spot a spot a bit of spot leveling with a battery and some sandpaper, you may find that what you, you may find yourself out of fret material before you've bottomed these two out, which is starting to look like that. So I'm going to stop taking any more fret material away because something's happened to those two frets which I'm not going to correct by taking loads more material away from everything else. That little bit there can be solved by the tiniest of adjustments there. Okay, dirty, but we're done with this business of fret levelling. I'm going to stop there and now we can say goodbye to these strings which have done great service as sacrificial strings and they can come off and the next thing I'll do is just wipe off some of this dust and then we'll repaint the frets with mark pen and after that uh, go at it with the fret crowning file which is down there to just get the frets back to an arch form if possible and then we'll go through a boring but necessary process of polishing out with several different grades of sandpaper um, which takes about half an hour and I don't film anymore because it's too dreary like this isn't um, but it goes through 600 grit uh, 1000 grit 1500 grit paper and then I switch to a micro mesh set um, which runs from 1500 through to 12,000 and sometimes, depending on how I feel, I end up with a an Autosol car chrome cleaner. Polish at the end, something flamboyant and generous. But um, sometimes, I mean, it's perfectly playable without that. That's, that's really more of a visual thing than anything else. Um, 
Okay, so pull off all these little darlings and chuck them into a bag of stuff. So there you go, there's the leveled neck um, with its slightly flattened frets in different amounts in different places. Any sign of my mouse? No, hasn't taken the bait yet. Um, a slightly damp cloth, just get rid of some of the excess dust for a minute. Um, this fingerboard can do with a good clean in any second now as well, so that comes afterwards. But So, first off then, I take this and I mark up the fret tops again. And These I would say are medium frets, they're not jumbo. So I'm going to use the medium size of my side of my Stumac fret crowning file. I always say that I wouldn't call it a crowning file because it never actually or shouldn't ever touch the crown of the file. It, it works on the shoulders of the flat spot really, so I call it a fret reprofiling thing. But while we're there, um, it's probably a good idea to take the Dremel, a bit noisy, take the Dremel to this top of this uh, nut and just take it down a bit. If it was if it was bone, you'd have that lovely distinctive bone smell, burning bone that you get, you get in hospitals. But it isn't, so um Okay, so that's that's that. I just I think that's pretty much it. There's there's plenty of room for the uh, strings to sit in the slot, so you can just you can go as low as you like as long as you leave the slot in place. <coughs> and that just I, I might take another file and just um, take off the sharp edges of that. But that's uh, that's all I need to do really to to um, just reduce the height of the slots so they're not sitting in the bottom of a trough really or a great big canyon um, which isn't necessary I think I've said this before in older videos but once upon a time I remember a time back in the maybe the 80s or something where when friends in the know about guitars would, would tell you that there was this thing where you had to have the strings sitting kind of it, the art was to get the string sitting just in a little cup uh, and, and the better your, the, the more your strings sat on top of the nut, like ball in a cup kind of thing, the better you were as a guitar person. And of course people did that regardless of how, how what the first fret action was. So you had all these beautifully manicured nuts, pardon me, beautifully manicured nuts um, with ridiculously high first fret actions and everybody thought they were doing great um, and their guitars were unplayable but they looked fab you know like like somebody had done it or, or gone to the right kind of a nail gone to the right nail bar or something so i'm just going to use this uh just to get a sort of general overall level to it at the moment because it's, it's just a little bit uneven for my liking <sighs> yeah dash looks good it's actually a bit, I don't know, that's right, I thought it was a bit overhang on this nut, but it's okay. Okay, so that's the, that's that done, lowered down. Um, now we get the medium side of this file. And the idea is just go across the top, and what I'll see is a little black stripe. Well, I'll see two silver stripes appear as the edges of this file cut away at the, the edges of the flat spot. <coughs> Um, and the idea is to keep doing it until you've got the thinnest possible black line down the middle and stop. If you continue until the black line's gone, it means you're starting to take metal, metal off the top of the fret, which you don't want to do because you're in very much danger of changing the relative height of it compared to the, uh, the other ones. So the first couple of swipes you can see 
how much flatness there is by virtue of the size of the or the thickness of the black line down the middle. In this case of you can see me tilting and working away at that line to as thinnest it can be. Um, as thin as a spiv's moustache. What I'm thinking, and I'm thinking of Dad's army when I say that for some reason. Um, anyway. <laughs> All the way down here with this. You can do this with three sided file, which I had out sometime a minute ago, where it's, I don't know where it's gone. Can I see it? No, I can't. Anyway, three sided file will do it. Um, this is an expensive file, but it is a, a time saver um, and it's kind of a bit more brain off or a bit less brain on. Um, and away we go. Hey, I've pretty proud of myself. I've been doing this all day, most of the day, and I haven't me mentioned how crap the weather is yet. Did I tell you how crap the British summer is? It's awful. I was lucky I even got enough dry weather to go and take the mice, the invisible mice, back to the field. Harry Houdini and his partner in crime. I don't know what to say, but I was coming back over the field, I was so pissed off. I was genuinely thinking about letting the cats into the shed and saying, go on then, I give up. I've tried to save you guys, but you don't want it. Now, now deal with Morris and his sister. They're all yours. But I couldn't do it. So, and if anything, <coughs> the resourcefulness of the little plastic chewing mice um, made me even fonder of them and wanting to capture them properly to give them a chance of freedom and instead of just going down Morris's throat which he's likely to do if he catches them of course what you never see in this lovely cutesy story is the, the two they killed yesterday um, they don't feature in this tale um, and I've gone into the burner for some dry day when I get to burn some cardboard but, so there's there's two died yesterday one was a mouse and one was a, a vole and then apparently Claire said they had a bird the other day as well and but they were killing merrily despite my attempts to save things I've also noticed the frets edges are sharp on here, so I might go over this with the end files and just try and tidy them off a little bit. Yeah, oh god, they're horrible. Okay, so that's that bit done. I'm going to just put that off to one side. Now I'm going to stop the thing because the rest of it is sanding with paper and it's boring. I might, I'm not going to. I was going to say I might pull this up to have a look, but I'm not going to. Um, it is out. It's clear of the string, so I'll leave it where it is. This thing feels like it needs ideally a replacement, but that's something uh, for Paul to perhaps think about. It's an easy enough task to replace it anyway. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, go into the process of masking this off with tape, um, um, and then I'm going to do all the sanding. And then once I've sanded, I'm going to clean everything up, and then I'm going to oil the board and put the new strings on and see where we are back in a bit. And so here we are with the Tanglewood with the uh, frets leveled, repro reshaped, profiled and um, everything cleaned up and basically ready to have the strings back on. I could give this a little hand wipe and clean. Um, but yeah, we're, we're pretty much all there. Um, Kevin's just asked on Facebook, how do I rate the Tanglewood? And I don't really know yet. I um, haven't had a chance to play it, um, so I guess I'll find out shortly um, when I get, get it sort of right up and running. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I think sort of structure-wise, it's hard to really say, isn't it? You, you've got sort of basic structure, build and finish, and then you've got playability and sound. And playability for me isn't actually 
is not very much a function or not usually a function of the brand as much as the setup that it's been given you know as you'd expect me to say but um, so I don't really I don't really it's difficult to say oh this this Tanglewood has got a you know a great playability over something else because if it's been given a great setup then it will do um, so it's unless I was getting it from the shop brand new or from the factory I should say uh, it'd be it's very difficult to make a claim about that because what we're really only talking about is its its initial playability as 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 delivered kind of out of the box playability really uh, anything other than that is entirely dependent on how how it's lived throughout its life so we don't really know um so just the simplest parts of it build quality you know solid block down the middle hollow body um standard looking electrics i can't see inside exactly to see uh, what the quality of them are but they don't look there's no reason to think they are unduly good or bad um, much of a muchness for Chinese uh, manufactured stuff. A little bit annoyed about the unmovability of these pickups. I don't want to take the whole thing apart um, just to kind of move them. They, they're okay, but they, I'd rather they stay in place. I do quite like the, the double pickup adjustment here where you can get at least a bit of a, on the, the Yamaha, vintage Yamaha, you can at least get a bit of a tilt going or sta uh, straighten out the tilt if you want to. Anyway, um, so how do I find it? Well, I don't know until I play it. Did the, did the pickup strike me as anything particularly fantastic? Well, yes, no, nothing major. I mean, we've got here a, a trim unit, which is, uh, I don't really know. It's a, it's a copy of a, um, uh, you know, a Bigsby, a Bigsby clone, should we say. And uh, to be honest, I don't really know how well, it's going to perform until I get it going. Um, it's, it, they're always a bit on the clunky side. Um, I'm doing my best to clean up the bit, bits as much as possible, but uh, you can see it's a very primitive structure and it has to obviously, it works with the spring, and the spring itself is a, an old fashioned y thing. You know, there's not a lot you can uh, oil up or anything to make it run smoother. I guess there's a little bit of oil you could put down and the barrel of these or in this shaft here but axle here but that should work all right good old-fashioned thing spring there so I'm just letting the oil sink in a little bit and then it'll be time to re-string it um, and uh, I know Paul said he wanted nines but at the moment I've got hybrid nines which are which are uh, or do I have nines? Actually, I have got some nines here. That's true. Da -da. It's the only set of nines I've got. I'm out of nines. I'm out of nines. Now, this is a bit fiddly, this stringy business. So, we're going blue. Are we going? Yeah, we're going. Are we going blue? Yeah, blue, white, red. Red, white, blue. You'd think it would be red, white, and blue, wouldn't you? Something about that makes sense. But, okay, this is a fun bit because you have to go. You have to go. You have to go, how do you have to go? You have to go from there. Um, from there, under there. Oh, that's gone under there automatically for me. Uh, under there. Right, without, without crimping, damaging the thing. So let's just see where we're at. Okay, let's let's see a simple, sim sensible way of doing it. If we go, are we going to go over the top of this one? So if we go under there, over there, and back under here. So it's over there. Come on, quite some, quite some curve around to there, like that. So we're looking at how it goes on. Uh, and then it just wants to fall off, which is typical. <laughs> How do you get it to stay on? I don't know. Push it on a bit more, possibly. It's kind of counterproductive, but... Okay, well, let's just put this one on, just for fun, and see if it will stay on. So, having done, set the action. 
uh, see like it comes off so I need something to push it back on. Set the action both ends um, then leveled the frets it definitely wants to come off and there's no I just think it's never going to go that high is it so it's going to go to there. Let's put this under here now so we can see where it sits. Um, yeah so set the action done the fret leveling reset um, re profiled the frets and then um, polished them out and cleaned up the whole of the body, cleaned the bridge, oiled the fingerboard and now putting the first of the new strings on and this is a set of nines so I'm just kind of loosely putting them on so I got a chance to um, uh, make sure this thing sits on properly because it's all a bit, it's all a bit weird. Okay, well that's that's kind of it's there starting all right. Um, so let's do it again. We'll come down here, under there, over there. I wonder if there's some sort of clever way of getting putting a bend in it from the beginning. Bend it there. Pull it there. No, I've gone the wrong way. Oh, <laughs> it's so confusing. Over the top. That's why it's difficult to do, because you come over the top and come under the bottom and who knows how that's going to stick. Then over the top of that. Right. I wish I had, a, I wish I had one of those capos that I could put on here, just to hold the string in place maybe. Would it? Yeah, that's quite cool. Right, anyway, yeah, so I'm just going to re-string this little one and then we get to have a, a play and try out. Now, what? A, that's very good, but if I have a cap on there, I can't actually pull the string back. So we're going to run the risk of it dropping off anyway. That isn't the right place. Oh, holy moly! Wake up, Samuel. <laughs> I'm still in shock, obviously, from my mouse shock earlier on. I'm doing this. I was going one and two. I was doing some other brand of strings. What I need is opposite side of the headstock. That's where I need to go. Now this is, this is quite, doesn't give you an awful lot of spare string at this point. It's enough, but it's not as much as you used to. So it's just enough to wrap around. Um, yeah, so be ready to give this a, a try out. Now the, the Yamaha, which I did earlier on, or fretted yesterday and today, finished the fretting today, that I'm going to play test play that as well because I'm not sure if it's quite where I want it to be. So I gave it one initial very light fret leveling. Um, so I'm going to give it a bit of a, a play through um, and really just test out how well it does. Um, it's, it's quite often the case, that, especially when I'm doing an old classic like that, that I'll end up doing two fret levels. Um, I think, it's, I think it's because I'm erring very much on the cautionary side to begin with. I don't want to take off any more than I need from the outset. So I kind of probably under underdo it. Um, which gives me a sort of chance to do it another level, another fret level later. It cost me a set of strings, but you know, for the price of um, I can keep them as, as uh, what do you call it, sacrificial strings, and you know, for the, for the amount of, or how important the refret is, it's a uh, it's price worth paying really to get it right. Um, and sometimes you, I might think, well, I could have restrung it with sacrificial strings instead of the new ones, but um, you know, sometimes I'm kind of thinking, well, it could could just be right, you know, it could just be at the point where it's correct. In which case I don't want to be, um, you know, I don't want to be stringing it once and then taking them off and putting other strings on afterwards. Okay, so what's um, not moved is this should be down on the ground where it was. So if you remember, we set the, the action as low as it could possibly go. Um, just looking at where all these things sit. They're not the tidiest of things as they come into the... Uh, I'll come around the back of this bar, but they do under full tension. I think they, they do tend to 
tidy themselves up, or sort themselves out. It's, um, it's, quite, it's quite difficult. It's a bit of a required taste stringing these things because you have to somehow find a way of, with your big ham fists like me, you have to kind of bend these over in such a way that you can get them to hook onto these little pegs. It's probably a smarter way of doing it, but I haven't, I haven't reckoned it through yet. So we get it on like that. And then we pull it forward like that, and that's got caught up the side, which we don't want. <laughs> right, and then slack it off. There should be something that holds it in place. That would be very cool, but there isn't. So, uh, sort of, sort of. So uh, nines is quite light on a guitar like this. I mean, it's light on any guitar, I guess. But and I, I don't, I haven't made my mind yet. I, I think I. I've tried different things and sometimes I like 10s, sometimes I like, I've even enjoyed 11s. I remember doing Russ's um, Oakcaster number 12 and uh, putting 12, uh, putting 11s on it, um, which were completely alien to me. But once I put them on, I just thought, oh, I might want to put these on all of my guitars. So I've got a whole, a whole set of uh, 11s ready to be, and I might, I might just go and switch some of mine out. So currently I've got an oak caster sitting um, in my headless one has the neck off and I was just, I'd reshaped the end of it because because it was a prototype, I hadn't um, hadn't bothered. There was a little bit of sort of raw wood at the end of the, the headstock bit but I hadn't bothered um, kind of finishing off completely because since I was keeping it and just playing it myself. Um, and then I thought, well, I'm going to do it since I've got the time at the moment. Um, so that's why it's in bits uh, and one day it's in bits I said oh should I put a should I just leave it there and maybe put a or while it's in bits should I put take the rail hammer from the other uh, my other prototype oak caster and put that in and I thought well I know I like it in that one as well what I really want is another set of rail hammers but I'm going to have to be very patient and decent and good and wait because I can't have everything more important that I sell the ones I've made than just keep hold of them and take them to band practice. Well, that's great fun. It's a bit, it's a bit indulgent. Okay, so I'm um, just sort of lining up to get the last one in. On over there, around the back. I'll try and put a bit of a bend in it. And then try and push it under here. Yes, ish. Oh, yeah, Bigsby's. I do like the Bigsby vibrato system. I think it's really, it's really solid and sort of crude in a nice way. Um, and it takes. I like it because it takes a lot of movement to achieve the small amount of uh, vibrato effect, which. Sometimes it feels like the, the Fender style one can feel too sensitive or too much, too much going on. Oh, come on you, get over the top of there. Yeah, to me it feels a little bit like it's over, over geared, although it's not the right word, but, um, but I've never yet gone as far as putting a Bixby onto one of my guitars, and either one that I own or one that I've made. So maybe, it's a future thing, although it's a, it, it's a bit of a big pile of stuff to put on the end of an oak caster whose purpose is, um, has always been as a travel guitar. There's no doubt about that. It's not, it's not, um, you know, it's not a full size guitar. It's full scale, but not full size as such. Okay, so I've got my strings on. What I'm going to do is cut off the little excess bits save me from drawing any more blood than I have to and uh, right so I'm going to expect tonight to catch one of these little mice back the field mice they haven't gone in there yet although the peanut butter must be calling to them something rotten no it's not something rotten it must be very tempting, is what I mean. Now the interesting thing about 
this thing is it's a floating tremolo effectively um, and really it probably needs tuning up uh, via a, a, a sort of fixed comparative set of notes which I probably have here not perfect but it'll do Yeah, it is. So when it's a floating tremolo, you have to kind of do reference tuning off a fixed tuning with like another guitar and keep going until it reaches equilibrium. You can't really do a relative tuning from harmonics or from one string to another. And it's basically going to keep on going until you reach a balance between the string pull and the spring pull or the spring resistance and the string pull whichever way you want to call it um, meantime before I get too tightened up I'm just gonna push around these strings until they're tidily spaced and then they're gonna be perfect but of course you've got even though it's a steel bar here you have got a bit of resistance under here which can catch uh, catch the strings so what I'm also going to do is while I'm here is I'm going to just stretch out some of this slack as well. Um, so it's a combination of the strings and springs reaching equilibrium and stretching the inherent slack out. And all of that has to be taken care of before this thing will reach playing condition. Um, and being in set of nines, I'm probably going to be snapping some off any second now. Snapping some nines. So the biggest problem with this guitar when I got it was the height of the action um, and the nut. It was a, a grippy mess. So it was going out of tune every second. And like any guitar in that condition, it'd be horrible to play. Taster. Wow, that, that still sitting up there. There's something wrong with it. Worn. Oh, what a low action. But again, still a bit more of the old stretching to do, and listening out for pings on the nut as well. That's the really important thing, and it'll give us the, the sort of telltale that whether we've got free running strings or not. And I always say this, that a lot of people re resort to using um, lubricants in the nut slots. And I said, if you're getting tuning instability or you're hearing pings and the strings are sticking, don't try and cure it um, by using a, a lubricant. Well, it just won't, it won't work. Um, it may temporarily free it up a little bit, but it will either wear away and you'll still be left with the basic gripping problem which will give you a return of your tuning instability um, or it just won't work from scratch. You'll think it will but it will still be struggling to stay in tune. So I would say get those nut slots right first even if you have to use a little bit of sandpaper to widen them until it stops pinging but ideally cut them the right oversized first. Mm. 
Yeah, so you can feel the, you can hear the strings creaking at this end. It's still in tune. It's all at this end, creakiness. A roller bridge here would help, uh, and a better quality bar here would help, to be honest. But there's nothing you can do, it's always going to be against steel. I mean, you could lubricate it. Wouldn't, wouldn't hurt the sound at all, since it's on the other side of the bridge. Um, so I'll do a couple more pulls, but we're kind of getting close to both um, stretch out and spring spring equilibrium. Spring spring equilibrium. It's a bit of a mouthful. Trying not to bust the strings. This just saves having to restring. Squeaking on a towel. From a guitar that I strang, strang, strang this morning. So it's not surprising if that's out of tune as well. But let's go relative now. those creeks. That's creaking over the bridge more than anything. That's why I recommend a roller bridge there. So let's just double check the action for a second because we may well be down on the low side at the moment. Right, we're just over a millimetre there, which is probably a bit low, and we're we're off way off there. How did that happen? That's probably wound down a little bit, but let's back up there. Let's back up a tiny bit here. <laughs> Clear of all the Pick up so we're 1.5 there, which would be my target start, and there's just under one there, which again would be a little over what I'd want. shame spoiled with that creaking over there but anyway there it is um, we'll check the intonation separately from this but right now for now I'm going to leave this uh, sort of sit for a little bit sorry sounds horrible creaking on the towel over there but there we go so that's that's the tanglewood setup just um, Basically got the intonation to go and a bit of test playing and hopefully 
I think I'm just going to put a little message out to Paul in a minute and suggest getting a replacement bridge in it because it's, it's, it's a nice unit. It's horribly creaky. I mean, it's a, sorry, it's a budget unit, but there's no reason why it should be so spoiled. You should have to spoil it with creakiness. Um, and I don't have any spare roller bridges knocking around, but it would really improve it with one. Um, this isn't the worst bit. It's, it's a creaking across here. There's no creaking through there. That's nice and smooth running. So um, otherwise, it's very nice. Anyway, uh, I shall see you again soon. Hello there. It said wait, but now it's on. Hey, I'm, I'm just, um, I don't know, this is just a quick intermission. Um, and the reason why is I'm just here doing a little pull test on some frets. I did, I was just trying out, I wanted to try out Gorilla Glue. I like a lot of Gorilla products and I'm always, I'm always on the lookout for a a, um, a glue that really helps or really is really good for the fretting, the world of fretting because um, wood glue is very gentle and it's good, it's, it seems to respond quite well to heat and um, I could be wrong but it seems to it seems to help so that you can pull the frets later on a bit easier. Um, super glue is really effective and quick um, but in my experience on a maple neck, sorry not a maple, on a rosewood neck super glue sticks really cr in a really crystallized sort of way to the surrounding fingerboard, sorry on a rosewood neck. Did I say what you get? Anyway, so what you get at the end of it when you pull on, on the with super glue, you, you tend to pull out loads of little chips out of the rosewood, and it's almost impossible. Uh, and it also doesn't seem super glue doesn't seem to respond to heat. It seems to it seems to form a crystalline sort of hard, crunchy mass. And as a result, um, if if there's a piece of um, rosewood, if it sticks to the rosewood, it'll the rosewood flake will come up. Whatever you do. So I just thought I'd do a a little test, um, you know, because. I tend to work with super glue, and the reason being is if I'm refretting a, a guitar um, with. Uh, well, actually, let's put it another way. I found that um, wood glue, in some circumstances, just isn't isn't strong enough, um, and uh, I'm finding that if I clamp, if I do wood glue, I tend to have to clamp a whole block of frets together and then wait for six to eight hours or something, and then take the clamp off to see if they have s held down, particularly around the edges, especially if you're doing a little overhang. Um, and it doesn't seem to have that sort of, that immediate bonding, that strength of bonding around the edges particularly. So with wood glue, I often find that I end up with slightly lifted fret ends, particularly where I'm working over the top of a um, either sealed, a sealed um, fret slot ends or binding. Um, and whereas super glue is just so fast, and and to be honest, if I'm giving a guitar a new set of frets with, let's say, 30 years of new life in front of it, playing life, then in a way, it's not the biggest end of the world. Um, it's slightly different with uh, with lacquer. It may or may not lift up bits of the lacquer, um, but I suspect it won't pull it quite the same way as it pulls flaked um, rosewood. Anyway, so. So superglue is my kind of favourite go-to, and I know a lot of people. Uh, I've seen people fretting on you, doing frets on YouTube, and and even you know, some of the professionals, they they'll put a fret in, clamp it in, then they'll wick in superglue through here, just let it go into the slot, and then they'll either press it down or do whatever they need to do, um, and it seems to be an acceptable way of doing it. Um, but the same problem exists uh, that that you will you run the risk of pulling up chips of. Um, Rosewood, but then again, you do pretty much anyway, whatever glue you do. But I, I, it's my experience that it's a bit worse with super glue, anyway. So, I did a series of little experiments here. The, the Gorilla Glue is interesting because I've, just, I've got a few samples here which I've been using. Um, it's interesting for me because it comes in a little tube which is which gives me the app both the combination of the applicator plus the consistency of this stuff makes it actually perfect for getting it into the. Uh, or a little bead along the slot. Um, now I've done some experiments where 
uh, it says you need to wet the glue and then apply the sur surfaces so sometimes I've just kind of run some water over the top and then press the fret in and when you do wet it and press the two sides together what you get is a kind of expansion of the glue which then oozes out the sides now I've kind of watched how it happens and interestingly it does ooze out but it doesn't lift the fret out so I've let it ooze out and I've, I've done a variety of things I've let it harden and cut the excess off afterwards which seems to work fine I've also um, kind of scraped it back while it's soft and in this case cleaned with naphtha and it seems to have lifted it off quite well um, leaving leaving the cleanup quite easy on a, on a lacquered maple neck like this uh, I have gone over it today and scraped some of the edges with a with a knife not very carefully so there's a bit of scratching around there but it, it, the interest for me was to see what the pull was like on this now having done lots of kind of uh, I've done a few different things and I can't remember now I didn't I wasn't efficient enough to record which uh, which ones I put in just with glue which ones with glue and water and which ones you know uh, but I have got Gorilla Glue a set of Gorilla Glue here uh, I, th I think some of them one one of these four was just pressed in no water um, most of them had a bit of water added uh, simply because I could do if that's the way that it works I'll do that all the time and then there's two with super glue one is regular super glue um, which is the sort of st stuff I normally use that tends to the way I apply it that tends to squirt out the sides a bit clean it up there and then and this one is the one applied by pressing the fret in and then wicking the super glue in through the uh, slot now of course if you had a binding you wouldn't be able to do that <clears throat> so you'd need the super glue on the actual surface anyway the point being is I'm going to do a series of little experiments so first of all I'm going to pull a cold I'm going to cold pull a fret um, sorry about all the light here but anyway I'm going to cold pull the fret uh, done with the Gorilla Glue just to see what happens okay because I don't know how well it attaches so I pull it out and uh, what does it feel like yeah oops, crunchy sticks reasonably well that came out very easily uh, I'm going to pull another one along here just to see uh, how how well the whole thing is attached I'm just more than anything I'm trying to just get a feel of the the, the solidity of the basic bite of the glue versus the mess it leaves or otherwise so is it a good glue that's quite easy to release now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the same Gorilla Glue and this time I'm going to warm it a little bit. Now the advertising on the packet says impervious to heat. Um, what I don't know whether that means whether it softens slightly with heat or whether it is um, you know, ultimately just resistant to very high temperatures. Um, so I'm just having a kind of a feel of this by putting some heat into it and gently pulling up. This is all obviously on lacquered maple so uh, whether or not it would pull a load of rosewood up we can check in a minute so that came up and to be honest it doesn't feel like it's softened it any more than it had there um, now the interesting one for me is the two super glues um, I, as I said I know super glue doesn't really seem to respond to heat at all so let me try and pull a super glue I have to say really it's not that much more solidly attached um, that's regular super glue same same sort of feel to the residue left behind this is the wicked on version um, this actually feels a little bit no, well, kind of similar really a little tidier around the edge here because that was actually gripping only by virtue of what was holding onto the tang um, and then we have a Gorilla Glue down here but, but we've kind of done most of those so fairly inconclusive in one sense but let me just have a quick go at <coughs> This rosewood stuff. Now I've left these are these are both or three, three of them. These are I think one of them is shoved on without any foaming, and one of them's definitely foamed up here. Um, and I'll take this one out without any heat at all. And I can see it trying to lift up a bit of rosewood, but it's pulling up its sort of gluey residue. You can see it's a bit messy in there, um, or messy on the surface. But actually that <coughs> that would come off pretty easily with a sort of re you know if you were sanding and resurfacing um, and also if you were getting in there to clean out the slot a bit um, it would also come out so not super destructive there's another one here um, 
Let's try this one with a bit of heat. I think this may have been one without lots of water on it, on it. But again, I mean, you know, the point is, it's actually quite strongly attached. It's not going to fall out. Uh, and I think the important bit is that it doesn't feel much more or less attached than super glue, so that there doesn't not an appreciable difference. I mean, yeah, crud left behind. You know, we got a bit left over here, and actually. You know, I couldn't, or I'm struggling, to pull it up with my fingers. So, super glue, as you can see, I've got a bit hanging over here, it's quite sharp. Oh, I cannot pull that with my fingers, even with a little bit of an overhang. Of course, I could probably do it with a block. Um, but again, that's probably no more or less what you could do with um, with uh, any other kind of frets. These slots are very very wide, the frets alone, the frets by themselves kind of fall out of these pretty quickly um, or they go in and out very easily. So this is this is without any kind of wood gripping but that's not too bad really as a, a substance. So I guess what I'm, I'm looking at is something I can use that's effective to get into the slots with the tidiest, um, the tidiest, after, uh, you know, consequences. I'm just going to have a look and see how easy or how well this stuff cleans up. But again, I can just really just scrape it clean if I was really. Now, if I hit it really hard, I'm liable to scuff up some of the uh, rosewood and, and take some take some uh, flakes out but you know it's uh, it's cleanable upable back to you know back to a, a workable usable surface um, and then again it's a bit crunchy but it's no more uncleanable outable than anything else um, you do have to take great care to prep the um, fret slots when you when you come to refret because you you can't afford the ends to stand up. Actually, these are hollow and um, these are cut all the way through, so it's actually quite easy to do. Well, easier than trying to do it within the constraints of a, a binding. But that's not that's not any better or worse than super glue. So it's a it's a doable thing. As you can see, it's leaves a leaves a, a mess, but. It's not an uncleanable mess with a bit of um, just a little bit of clean up time. And as I say, you'd have to do that with super glue. My experience has been, and I didn't do any super glue tests on here actually, but my experience has been that super glue has, ha, ha, it feels to me like it tends to pull up a little bit more. Um, but there you go. So I, I would, I would make, for me, I would make Gorilla Glue a viable equivalent to. Um, Sorry, a viable alternative stroke or equivalent to the super glue that I use anyway. Um, <clears throat> I, in some ways, I, my perfectionism was trying to avoid using super glue, um, but actually, in a way, if you look at the priorities, <coughs> where does my where does my priority lie? Well, the priority lies in is getting a well seated pile of frets to, to kick off with uh, more so than um, you know what what exactly how the surface of the rosewood is in 30 years time if and when somebody comes to refret that guitar again um, so anyway just thought it might be vaguely interesting so much of a muchness um, easier to apply actually if I can providing I can get loads of samples like this these minis um, that actually is quite an easy stuff to apply um, probably cleans up better on maple than uh, rosewood, but then the same applies with rosewood. Um, what I tend to do with when I'm super gluing on rosewood, uh, I tend to end up giving the fingerboard uh, a clean up like this, similar, something like this afterwards. This is a very <coughs> effective way of just getting rid of all any glue residues and just taking it back to a nice smooth finish ready to oil sorry ready to oil so 
again not a problem the the excess for cleaning up so yeah I might give it I might do a, a couple of guitars that way and um, see where see how it goes in the long run so meanwhile let me just put this into a hanger out of the way safely right <clears throat> I'm gonna come back with another guitar okay, so here we have um, Paul's thingy um, Tanglewood uh, what's it? AS oh, AS39F and um, I've got the new bridge fitted to it and I haven't intonated it yet but it's in a pretty basic intonation preset pattern so it shouldn't be a problem one thing I noticed about this bridge straight away is that uh, it's taller than the other one and I had the other one down on its stops so already to reach the kind of action I want so the result of that is that this bridge is actually higher than my ideal target action um, now in a way it plays great so it's not really a problem I have a choice uh, to grind off or file off some of the underside of this bridge just where it, re it sits on the saddles which isn't a saddles posts which isn't a problem at all um, because it's the underside of the bridge and it's only a, a little those end sections and I've done it on bridges before so basically you would kind of just file down this bit here and this bit here and it just gives you back um, a millimeter or two and it gives you back the action so I'd probably do that to, to give us the the option on it. It seems silly not to have spent money. I've got the nice roller part of it, which gives us the creak free uh, vibrato effect, but then to kind of lose the adjustment ability. And that's because, I guess, in a set, set neck, the, the angle is given and it's made for a, a shorter bridge, the original bridge that came with the guitar, and obviously designed for that guitar. And the next one is a little higher because it's a generic replacement. Anyway. So, um, but this, this is a, I've been just playing this for the last 10-15 minutes and I'm really enjoying it. It's still got a little bit of going out of tune happening and there's a tiny ping.
infinitum and stuff. Um. This is set on a kind of uh, classic amp setting and it does a great ziggy in with it. Oh hey 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 Come on. it's going out of tune still slightly. which it was before. Thank you. 
nice tones. Like I said, I will take a little bit off the underside of here because it seems pointless having leveled the guitar for a really low action and then being kind of constrained back upwards by the nature of the new bridge, but it's no, it's not any big deal. So, um, yeah, just a, a nice sounding guitar. So. does it sound like or how do I rate it um, taking all the effects off and stuff and even the reverb easier to do than the other style bridge mainly because it's a it's a tunematic style but it's got roller bridge and it's got a longer travel um, but let's just let's just try it one of the things I find with all the bridges I buy from Vanson I don't know if um, Ben at Vanson does this on purpose They all seem to be set accidentally or by chance to the intonation pattern that I want. Still a bit of stretching to do on this guitar, which I will do in a minute. Yeah, <laughs> beautifully done. Thank you. 
this one is saying it's a little bit short um, and I do, the A and the E are a little bit short so armed with the screwdriver and the fantastic access that true pneumatic bridges always give me I'm going to drag these two, actually they need to be further back this pattern isn't right and I'll take that back it's, it's a little bit off <laughs> I can see visually but the first three are in the right place that's good news the second three are off the mark I'm going to put this down to do it because it's nigh on impossible to do it in the standing up position but we do need it in the up position to do the testing um, yeah we want three these three are good so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what I know tends to be the case so I can actually drag this out of the way it's probably easier and pull this one back and it's usually starts about there is the ideal spot and then this one off and then Back, back, back. They're sort of a mimicking. They're a, they're a reproduction of the first. When you have three, three plain and three wound, it tends to be one mimics the other in terms of their relationship between each of the three, and then they all step back a little bit. So the start, the the D starts a little bit back from where the E starts, um, but. A little bit forward of where the G got to, um, which tends to be the sort of the basic spread. So that tends to be about right. Let's just have a play. I find the bass notes can be quite challenging anyway, even on a good day. Receiving overtones here. So to sort of know which to trust, really, um, you can get some different. There's a little bit of buzz coming off this, but. So immediately you think. That was low, but actually, if you just hit it where it should be hit, now that would suggest if you try just went on that alone, get the A note to stabilise. What you get. I'm no expert in this by any means, but what you get is you'll have an attack part which goes sharp and then as the note decays, it'll, if it's not the right note, it'll, it can often go, see there's a sharp attack, then it will stabilise. So that's all over the place, but it's definitely, um, I would say that's the, that's the A. It's a little flat. And that's a little sharp according to this, but that, in a way, that means one has to go forward and the other one has to go back, which is a bit of a, a bit of a deceptive thing, really.
Sometimes when I can't quite trust either of my machines, I go by ear. You can hear that. That's in. So if that's in, that's intonated. What happens is the, the, the confusing bit is that when you press the note first, you get. You get a harmonic that's playing this bit. You kind of think they should be the same, but they don't seem to be. Despite what the little readings are telling me. Basically, sometimes you just have to trust your ears. There we go. That is intonated as far as playing it and having all the notes stay in tune. Um, I like it. One of the things I've just, I'm going to do is do that little shaving off, filing off the bottom. Um, and I'm also, or all, uh, what I have also done, uh, is just done a little repair on the edge of this here. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than the great big chunk that was missing before. And I've kind of just left it the way it is. I've left it smooth rather than sand it down or anything. So it's kind of as painted on and it's, it is a nitro blobbed repair, which is not the same as the actual lacquer that's on the guitar body. Um, but I use nitro for a repair like that because it's quicker. Um, it's a budget guitar, it doesn't change, it's not going to have any effect on the long term residual value of it since it's better than just the hole that's already there. Um, but it's there just to, mainly to improve the playability and that's, it. that's the main idea. So if I just lift this up and off, bring it out from under there. Right, so what I'll do is I'll just take a little bit of material from under there um, just to give me that extra amount to work with. Um, it'll look like it's been, uh, the underside will look like it's been cut, but you won't really notice the difference. You can see it's a much wider bridge, gives you gives you more uh, intonation room. And actually, if you look at it, the spread of the intonation is a bit wider on this second one anyway than it is on the first one. Um, now, I don't, ideally, don't want to have to take all the bits out to do this. Um, so I'm going to see if I can just hold it in place there enough to do it. Um, I think that will work. Um, and I shall use one or two files to do this. As I say, it's just it's just got to change, take down where the uh, bridge posts touch. There we go. This file will be ideal for the task. What I'll do is I'll just take a measurement at the end just so I know where I've taken. I'm going to take a millimetre off to give me that room to play with. Um, so I'll just take the edge measurement for now. Edge measurement is it's 9 mils or 8.82 so um, I'm going to come in at 8 mils exactly. 
it's just a matter of going by eye to keep this cutting the same amount all the way across. I'm measuring it, oh, measuring it regularly just to see where we go. 8.9 there. We want just 8, don't we? We come in at 8. 8.6. Um, I could do this with a Dremel probably. Okay, still. Could do it with a Dremel. That's one way. Or I can do it a little bit more cleanly and accurately with this file here. I can at least see better what I'm doing. Um, the Dremel would take it, take it more like to get in bigger chunks. So I'm aiming to get uh, I want about 8 all the way round so I'm just going to make sure I measure it. So 8.6 around there, 8.7 so it's just a matter of keeping it as flat as possible um, and then when, it, when I've done I just want to Make sure I gently soften off the edges so it hasn't got a razor sharp edge to it, which not only would look ugly, but it also runs the risk of um, catching on the fingers, which you don't want. So just a little, bit, a little bit of sandpaper on the edge. So, small amount of hand filing, taking it nice and slow. Still on 8.6 on the outside edge there. 8 .6. 8 .6. 8 .6. So we're kind of around the same amount. Maybe I'll try and take some more off on mass. edges so maybe time for some new ones as I keep switching around from one to the other but in a way it's probably quite good because they, they as you can see they're cutting very slowly which gives me a, a controllable cut Just hold off any marks on the chrome. I'm not sure how successful I'll be with that. Change direction. Get any more biting. slow which is good. No, no excessive hurry except when you miss and the thing falls off like that. It's mainly just all I want is to make sure it's as flat as possible. Um, that's my principal concern. It only has to be down around the area of the hole and just a, you know, a certain amount the outside of the hole is what we're aiming for. So it sits the lower part covers the thing round bit ring thing you know what I mean. Okay so look I mean from the front and the sides and stuff you know it's just got a little tiny edge burr which will take off but it's it's no different at all. Okay, 8.3, 8.2, 8.27, it's a little bit more to do, 
anyway, it's probably going to start getting really start getting really boring for you. Um, so what I might just do is stop now and come back when this is done. See you in a minute. Okay, just to round off, I've lowered very slightly uh, this bridge and it gets me a little closer to where I was aiming to go um, but not not quite there but we're now between 0.5 and 2 sorry 1.5 and 2 millimeters at the last fret low low E on the last fret and actually it plays nicely so I'm gonna stop it there um, could carry on cutting some material away technically possible um, but I'll stop because I think it plays good well plays well um, and I've just widened that D slot a tiny bit more to cure the pinging and I'll obviously keep stretching this for a little bit longer to check to make sure that tuning is then going to be stable because having the clean slots is your or the smooth running slots is your secret to successful tuning stability and then this just needs a bit of re-alignment spread out the strings here it's all a bit hit and miss really with the, this kind of tremolo not a bad thing but you just if you want it looking tidy you have to just move things yourself basically um, now, to go out of tune but a bit more, tu bit more tuning to do um, but we are pretty much there I'll do that inside got it stable what I'll do is I'll put some uh, I should do it now say so I'll, I'll put some graphite in the in the nut slots but actually there's no reason why not to do it now I can never find out I keep making a little tub full of this stuff and then I keep losing it so I'll just spit out a bit more which I'll no doubt waste more than I need it's always the way um, and then just place a little bit in each slot see a little bit of but this doesn't it, this is I've said several times over on videos this isn't a, a, a substitute for stretching out the strings um, or making sure that they don't ping by widening them with a bit of um, sandpaper you've got to get the width right to begin with um, before you really add this graphite stuff this is a sort of last stage but I'm putting it on now because I'm in the, in the workshop and I want to take this guitar out inside to play and stretch out the last bit of the string slack. Um, partly one of the reasons I want to take it inside is because I'm so tired of being out in 100% humidity. Well, it's 91% humidity right now because it's been raining for the whole of June and most of May as well. But certainly I can't really remember any dry... Maybe I'm being a bit hysterical here, but it's, uh, it's, this is at the moment in danger of going down as one of the worst uh, dunes I can recall. Um, it's just unbelievable the weather. It's cold, it's raining um, constantly, and everything is soaked. Um, I can't even be bothered to take you outside to prove it, but you can probably see out the windows there. Okay, so there we are. That is the AS39. F. Remember what the F stands for? Maybe F hole. You 
careful. Right, so that will go inside and get played a bit. Um, but yeah, ready to go. I'm ready to give uh, Paul a shout. And hopefully he can pick it up this weekend because it's ready to play. And of course there's a nice big case for it to go in which is in the house too. Alright, so thanks for uh, sitting this one out with me. And uh, verdict on that is, yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice semi-acoustic guitar. Um, there's a lot of nice semi-acoustic guitars for the money. Uh, you could you could pick one of these up, you could pick up, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of other, oh, I mean, I've forgotten the name of, um, hmm, Washburn, there was a Washburn similar to this for very little money going in a buy and sell just recently. Um, so, you know, to be honest, most semi-acoustics made in this kind of factory in China are really good quality. Um, you know, the only thing you're going to improve on is the wiring, the pickups, and the condition of the frets, uh, you know, if, you, if you need to adjust them, but... This is, this is a nice playing thing. I'm just doing a quick check here. It's quite, quite a bit of relief in it, but I want that much on this guitar, because it's, uh, it's that sort of guitar. Right, so there we go. Play it in the house, check it over a couple of times, and we'll be, we'll be away. Bye for now.